Father Gregory and my dear fathers and, and brothers and brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so we, Father Gregory asked me a while ago to uh, take over or just kind of manage the monthly lecture series. And so I decided I would, the first two would be me and then hopefully other people will jump in because I'm sure if um, you don't want to hear me talk so much. But anyways, we're doing catechism um, as well. And so this is also a part of the catechism class. Uh, these will be a bit more eclectic. Uh, we'll be covering a lot, a wide range of topics, things that we either don't touch in catechism or things that um, we may want to flesh out a little more. Um, catechism class is usually around three hours. I've halved my notes, so I figure, you know, an hour and a half is perfectly reasonable for a talk on a Sunday after the Divine Liturgy. So, you know, I think that's something that's perfectly acceptable. It, it will not be an hour and a half. Um, so we are talking today, as Father Gregory said, about the scriptures. What they are, why we have them, what their purpose is, and why we should interact with them, or if we should interact with them. So before we begin to talk about any of those or answer those questions, the first thing we need to establish is what are the scriptures? What is this thing that we call the Bible? The scriptures are a collection of texts written by God-inspired authors throughout history in an unbroken chain of revelation. From the beginning of God's salvation, salvific work among men in the creation of the world, until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and ultimately his second coming and the end of the world. So these scriptures contain the entire history of the world from its creation by our Lord to its end and ultimate uh, renewal in the second coming of Christ, the redemption of all things due to the fall of man. St. Philaret of Moscow says that the scriptures are certain books written by the Spirit of God through men sanctified by God, called prophets and apostles. These books are commonly termed the Bible. So the Bible is a bit of a misnomer. In Greek, it's, it's hobiblos. Uh, it means it is the books, the collection of books. So it is not one book. It is not a monolithic thing. It is a collection of many different books that cover many different topics and address many different themes, all of which ultimately form a coherent uh, story. They, they form a coherent uh, narrative from the creation of the world until its final end, right? So these books can be split up predominantly into two collections, two collections of books that cover the same thing ultimately, but one is looking to it and the other is reveling in the reality. And these are the Old and the New Testaments. The Old Testament are the books of the Bible written before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In these books, we read of the creation of the world, the fall of man, the promise of the redemption by God, and the history of preparing mankind for this redemption. We also read of the collected history um, of the people of God leading up to this point, and as well the various uh, different revelations of wisdom that were given to the people of God through the various prophets. St. Philaret says that in the Old Testament, God promised men a divine savior and prepared them to receive him. So as we all know, if we go through the Holy and Great Lent, we read that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, he created man. He placed him in a garden to worship him, and man fell, right? This is all in the very beginning of the scriptures. And then the Lord promises them that this would not be the state they would remain in. They would not remain in death. They would not remain in separation from God. They would have a savior, right? But this is a very vague thing. This is a very vague saying given to the people. And in the Old Testament is a continued revelation of what this means, right? Of what it means that God will redeem Adam and Eve, that they will be forgiven of their sins. So throughout the Old Testament, we see a greater opening of the eyes of the people to who this person would be. At first, it was simply one who would step on the foot of the serpent. Then it became, well, this is someone who is a descendant of Abraham, and then he, of which tribe of, of Israel he would come from, and so on and so forth, where he was born. All of these things were revealed in the Old Testament in time. The Old Testament is a continuous revelation that is gradually revealing the coming redemption through prophecy and types. So there are things in the Old Testament that point to Christ. There are also things in the Old Testament that are icons of Christ. Or rather, we see them and we see like the serpent being raised up on the cross. And all who behold the serpent would be healed of their ailments or even of the prophecy of Isaiah. You know, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. So there are various different means through which the Savior is proclaimed in the Old Testament. And then there are the books of the New Testament. St. Philaret 
of Moscow says that in the New Testament, God has actually given men a divine Savior, his own only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So the New Testament contains in it the life of Christ in the Holy Gospels, the acts of the apostles, the teachings of his apostles through their various epistles, and prophecy concerning the end of the world and his second coming, which is the book of Revelation. So in the New Testament, you have the recognition that the Savior has come, the Messiah has come. What has he done for us? How has he accomplished the various things that were foretold in the Old Testament? And then the teaching of his disciples, those who he gave his authority, who then proclaimed to all of the world this reality. So throughout these books and throughout all of these, um, e even in the Old and the New Testaments, you have various themes that are present within them. You have uh, books of history. You have books of the law. You have doctrine and prophecy. These are the predominant themes within the scriptures. But this doesn't mean that certain books only contain certain things. Often there is great overlap between all of these things. Um, for example, in Genesis... The history of creation of the world until the migration of Israel and his sons. Uh, Genesis is a, is a history of the creation of the world until the migration of Israel and his sons to Egypt. It also, however, contains prophecies concerning the coming Messiah, doctrine, and commands that predate the law. And even these historical events can often be prophetic, or they can be things that which we understand what the law is. The Gospels are also a historical account of the earthly life of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they also contain the doctrine of the Lord and the lawgiver's explanation of the law as the Lord himself is the lawgiver. And the prophecies concerning his second coming, the end of the world, and so on and so forth. So in all of these books, which contain a predominant theme, you find a lot of overlap with all of these. You find within them history, doctrine, law, and prophecy. So knowing all of this, knowing what the Old Testament and the New Testament are, why or what, what they are, how we identify them. The next question would be, I guess, why do we have the scriptures? We have the scriptures because ultimately of our separation from God through sin. St. John Chrysostom, in his first homily on the Gospel of Matthew, begins it very interestingly. He begins it by recognizing that it would be better if we didn't have these books. He says, it were, indeed, if, it were indeed meet for us not at all to require the aid of the written word, but to exhibit a life so pure that the grace of the Spirit should be instead of books to our souls, and that as these are inscribed with ink, even so should our hearts be with the Spirit. But since we have utterly put away from us this grace, come, let us at any rate embrace the second best course. For that the former was better, God hath made manifest both by his words and by his doings. Since unto Noah and unto Abraham and unto his offspring and unto Job and unto Moses too, he discoursed not by writings, but himself by himself, finding their mind pure. So we see in the Old Testament all of these patriarchs in Genesis and Exodus uh, speaking with God face to face, right? Moses went up to the mountain and he spoke to God. When he came down from the mountain, his face was shining radiantly with the divine light. And the people were so afraid of this, they asked him to cover his face. So even their intermediary, who they wished to send up to the mountain themselves, they were terrified of, and so he too had to cover his face. Moses then, having spoken to God face to face, then wrote down what God said and presented these things to the people in letters because they themselves were unable to or unwilling to encounter God in the flesh and face to face. So St. John continues, but after the whole people of the Hebrews had fallen into the very pit of wickedness, then and thereafter was written word and tables and the admonition which is given by these. And this one may perceive was the case, not of the saints in the Old Testament only, but also of those in the new. For neither to the apostles did God give anything in writing, but instead of written words, he promised that he would give them the grace of the spirit. For he saith our Lord shall bring all things to your remembrance. So in, our, in the gospels we read, you know, the Lord never wrote anything. We don't have in the New Testament a gospel according to Jesus or epistles of our Lord. We're, there's only one account of him writing and it is in the sand which he scuffs away once he walks away. We don't even know what it is that he wrote. You know, he spoke to his apostles face to face. St. John, John continues, he says, And that thou mayest learn that this is far better, to hear when he saith by the prophet, I will make a new covenant with you, putting my laws into their mind and in their heart, and I will write them. 
and they shall be all taught of God. And Paul, too, pointing out the same superiority, said that they had not received a law, not on tablets of stone, but in fleshly tablets of the heart. But since in process of time they made shipwreck, some with regards to doctrines, others as to life and manners, there was again need that they should be put in remembrance by the written word. So the scriptures were given to us because of our sin, right? Our Lord, and, and nobody really, nobody writes a letter, for example, for those who are close to them. Nobody uh, with somebody who is face to face to them instead writes down what it is they wish to say to them and gives it to them. This is something that we do well. Perhaps we do now, now in our day of, of failure and of communication through various means of technology, but even then, um, usually we will talk to each other face to face, but if we are far away, then we will speak through various means that are detached from and lesser than per in-person conversation. But we see that this is not the way that our Lord has called for us to interact with him. When the, when the people were at the foot of the mountain, when the, Moses received the uh, tablets of the law, the Lord called for all of them to go up, and they refused. They wished for only one to go up. They wished for Moses to go up. They themselves did not wish to see God. So too, with the, um, with the coming of our Lord, you know, we even had people like we read today with the, with the uh, pig herders. They wished to be far from the Lord. They did not wish to encounter him. They wished for him to go away. And so the Lord allowed for the one, the demoniac, which he cast the demon out, to remain there and to proclaim the good things to them, to be an intermediary for him to those people. So too, throughout the history of the church, we have various elders, Yerandas, Yeranditsas, uh, who have spoken for us, who have spoken the word of God to those in need, those who are far from the death from the Lord due to their sin, calling them to repentance. See, there are certain ones who are close to the Lord, and then for the rest of us, we must depend on his written word. So God speaks to us through the scriptures because of our sins, because of our separation, and because of our fallenness. And this is very important. We must understand this when we wish to approach the scriptures, when we wish to approach God, because we need to recognize our own brokenness. We need to recognize how it is we are to encounter him, how it is we are to come to know him. We are to come to know him through the various means he has given us. One predominantly is through his written word, the words that he has given us, which proclaim the word of God. So why should we read scripture then? It's through the scriptures that we see God's will for us, through the means God himself has provided for us. St. Eustine Popovic says that all that is necessary for this world and all the people in it, the Lord has stated in the Bible. In it, he has given the answers to all questions. There is no question which can, be, can torment the human soul and not find its answer, either directly or indirectly in the Bible. St. Gregory of Nyssa in his commentary, or in his, his discussion with St. Uh, Macrina the Younger about the death of St. Basil and on the soul after resurrection, sought to understand what the scriptures say about the state of the soul. And St. Macrina said, it is good that you wish to do this for all, for all truth is sealed by the scriptures, or rather all truth is proclaimed by the scriptures. There is nothing that is true that the scriptures themselves do not proclaim. So to read the scriptures is to plant spiritual seeds in our soul of truth, which will only grow if watered by the life of the church. Without the seeds planted by hearing the words of scripture, the life of the church loses its clarity. A farmer waters the soil to produce fruit. So too we live the life of the church to cultivate the words of the word within us. If we neglect the scriptures, the life of the church doesn't have a clear goal and we fall into dejection. So we do all of these things, right? We come to church, we worship, the Lord, we partake of Holy Communion, we do all of these things, but if we do not heed the words of Scripture and understand the, the, the truth within all of this, a lot of this loses its meaning. A lot of this becomes dry, a lot of this becomes uh, rote, because we are not planting within ourselves the very seeds that the fathers themselves cultivated within themselves. This is the way of the saints, to be immersed in the scriptures, to allow these words of God, the words pointing to the word, to direct us to these things that are higher, to cultivate within ourselves the seeds of repentance. So knowing that, 
Knowing that this is the way that the fathers themselves lived, it is important to know how to approach the scriptures. Because these books are not just things we can pick up willy-nilly. They are not things that we can just pick up and read. Uh, we see even in the, in the New Testament when the Lord spoke to the Pharisees, there were very much different understandings of what the scriptures were. And his teaching about the scriptures, which was the true teaching, was rejected by many of the leaders at that time. And for this, they crucified him. So it's very important that we are very careful in understanding these words of God so that we don't fall into delusion, so that we don't fall into false teaching, so that we don't fall away from the Lord through understanding these in a manner that is not conducive to a healthy spiritual life. So we approach these first and foremost in repentance. The scriptures are written because we are far from God through our sins. We must recognize our fallenness. We must recognize the state in which we find ourselves in, which is a predominant lesson that we found this past week in the, in the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, right? They, they were such great apostles because of their recognition of their fallenness and their clinging to the Savior's mercy. We must also recognize or we must, through this, be grieved over our wickedness and seek union with God through repentance. It is through this, this repentance and recognition of our sins, that we can understand that which the Lord speaks to us through the scriptures. He speaks for all those who wish to turn to him. If we turn to him, we will receive that which he wishes to give us. But if we do not turn to him, then the words he has for us will be nothing more than chaff. They will be something which we don't understand. They will be difficult to uh, discern. And as such, we will, be, we will become dejected and we will make no spiritual progress. St. Peter in his first epistle to, um, in his first Catholic epistle, he says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, and all hypocrisies and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So we must recognize our state as spiritual babes. We must recognize our state as children approaching the Father of all to receive from him that which he has to give us through his word. In the reading of the scripture is the milk whereby we go strong in the faith and begin to live the spiritual life. St. Paul as well, he referred to all of his epistles as milk. He referred to it as something that those who are not spiritually prepared to hear greater things must first consume before they are strengthened to hear greater truths or for these truths to grow and cultivate within them. But this is the beginning. This is the starting point in our spiritual life. So it's through turning to the Lord it is through turning to the Lord that we come to know the meaning of his words to us. We must struggle to keep the commandments which are outlined in the scriptures in order to know the will of God. So we must be willing to put the things that we read in the scriptures as well to practice. St. Eustine, once again, he says the Bible is not a book but life because the words are spirit and life. Therefore, its words can be comprehended if we study them with the spirit of its spirit and with the life of its life. It is a book that must be read with life by putting it into practice. One should first live it and then understand it. So when we read the scriptures and we hear the commands of the Lord, we should seek earnestly and zealously to follow them, to do what is, what is said therein. And understanding will come in time when we make it a part of ourselves, when we bring it into ourselves, you know. There is this American adage that says, you are what you eat. Well, if what we consume with our eyes is the scriptures, we consume the word of God, then we will consume the truth of God, and we will ultimately be conformed to the image therein, which is Christ, as all of the scriptures point to the risen Lord, whether it be Old Testament or new. All of this proclaims Christ. And if we seek to be renewed by the scriptures, we will be made into the image and likeness of God by grace. You know, saying to Athanasios in his on, in, on the Incarnation of the Word, he says, if one wishes to understand the things of the saints or the holy ones of God, one must imitate their life. One must live the life of the saints to understand the saints. So too it is with the scriptures, which were written by the saints. One must live the lives of the apostles. One must live the lives of all those patriarchs and prophets, which was lives of repentance. <clears throat> The main thing is to read the Bible as much as possible, as St. Eustine tells us. When the mind does not understand, the heart will feel. And if neither the mind understands, more the heart feels. Read it over again, because by reading it, you are sowing God's words in your soul. The main thing is sow, and it is God who causes and allows what is sown to grow. But do not rush success, lest you become like a man who sows today, but tomorrow already wants to reap. This is a very important thing to understand when reading 
reading the scriptures, when reading any holy thing, is these things are being planted in our souls, and we must be patient and allow them to grow. We must allow them to grow to fruition, to partake of their fruit. You know, many of us have gardens in our houses, and if your gardens are not consumed by groundhogs like mine are, or a skunk, I had a skunk in my backyard this morning, which is a new development that I'm, is not welcome. But anyways, if your gardens are not consumed by rodents, you know that it takes a long time. It takes a long time to go from seed to fruit. It takes months. It takes uh, a lot of preparation, a lot of work in the soil, a lot of watering, a lot of tending to this thing, and often you don't see the results until the very last minute, until all of a sudden you have fruit. Like, uh, one thing that reminds me of this is blackberry trees, blackberry bushes. Blackberry bushes are basically fruit within two days. You see the bud and then it's ready, but there's a lot of time before that of preparation, of pruning the, the vine, of getting it ready before you get a lot of fruit, right? So all of these things must be done with patience. We can't just begin to read the Bible and say, okay, we're going to be saints tomorrow. No, we must allow these words to Im be immersed in these words and allow through that to grow the good fruit of the Lord. Patiently trust that the Lord is working in our hearts as we immerse ourselves in his divine words. It takes time for plants to grow and even longer for them to bear fruit. So we must be patient. It is also very important to make the scriptures a part of our daily rule of prayer. We should be willing to make the reading of the scriptures uh, a daily facet of our lives. This can be done either through the daily readings, which, you know, we have a calendar. I don't know where they are. Nope, they're back there. So there are calendars that have the daily readings. Every day there is a gospel and epistle reading to be read, um, with the exception of Great Lent. The weekdays we read uh, a few readings from the Old Testament. Um, there, is, there is a visual aid from my lovely assistant, lovely assistant yes, who is in a nice dress. Um, <laughs> so the, these calendars have the daily readings for us to read. It is a short, short selection of the gospels, of the epistles. Right now we're reading the gospel according to Matthew, and we're finishing up now the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, we'll be moving into Corinthians. So these are this is a good start, right? Every day in your morning rule to read the gospel and the epistle and see what the fathers have desired for us to learn. I found that these are very providential. Often the things we struggle with are found in these daily readings, and it is something that bears much conviction and much um, edification. As well, there are other very good practices that can be implemented. For example, the reading of the Psalter, the... Uh, Traditional monastic rule is to go through the Psalter once a week. Most of us are not going to be able to do that. But perhaps we can read a psalm with our daily prayer that is not out, not included in the normal thing. Or if we find ourselves uh, getting distracted by the various things of our day-to-day -day lives, to turn to the Psalter and allow ourselves to be distracted by prayer instead of by the various technologies that are around us. Another good one that was given to me by, um, by my family, you know, it's um, there are 31 proverbs in the month. Right? There are 31 pro chapters of Proverbs, 31 days in the month, sometimes 30, sometimes 28. But ultimately, if you read a chapter of Proverbs a day, just read whatever the calendar day is. And then you get a bit of wisdom there. This is the wisdom of Solomon. These are things that are conducive to a wise life, conducive to receiving the wisdom, which is Christ. So all of these things can be done to bring us into a state of understanding God's will for us understanding what it is he desires for us, how he wishes for us to live, and the means by which we can live a life of repentance, the means by which we can enter into the life of the church. So we, if we wish to live an authentic Orthodox life, the scriptures then must have a primary role in our rule. We must search them, be nourished by them, and allow them to touch our hearts, and thereby enter into the very same spiritual life that has guided the saints through the history of the church. This is the way of life brothers and sisters, is to be nourished by the scriptures, to allow the Lord to plant seeds of life into our hearts through the very words that he has given to us because of our fallenness, and through this, to turn to him, so that one day we may no longer need these words of the word, but may see him face to face. So are there any questions? Or comments or concerns? I take all of them. Father, I wasn't here for the beginning. Did you talk about different versions of the scriptures that people might or should or should not read no i didn't actually that's a very good thing so for those in america especially there are i don't i've lost count of how many translations there are there are so many some are good some are bad some are worse than bad some are even worse than that um so there there are so what we use in the church abroad is the king james version 
right? And this is, this is the um, this was a translation that was made for liturgical use. And I think it it is the translation par excellence. It, it is the best of the translations available in English. I find it to be um, the most eloquent, the most easy to understand with a little bit of effort, um, and, and really the most uh, conducive to worship. It's something that is very beautiful to be said out loud. Um, there are others as well that uh, have greater or lesser emphasis on a more, a or on a more um, literal translation of the Greek. Um, so the ESV is a good translation. There are so some that are, are translated intentionally to uh, teach certain things, for example, that are orthodox, like the New International Version, the NIV. Um, that, that is very much written with an anti-clerical and anti-orthodox um, anti mind. Um, so there, so there are good translations and bad translations. And that's something that uh, you find what works for you, but is also faithful to those original translations that we have. Um, the Orthodox Study Bible is also an excellent resource. It's the New King James Version. The Old Testament is translated from the Septuagint, which is really nice. Um, it it provides a lot of clarity that might be lost in a lot of American Bibles, which use the Masoretic text, which is a translation from the Greek, which is a bit confusing um, once you get kind of get into the weeds of that. So, yeah, there, there are various different translations you can use. I would recommend the King James Version. I think it is the best. Or the Orthodox Study Bible. Um, the notes in that are very good. Uh, and so, yeah. And Marina, you had a question? Yeah. So you read, um, especially the Old Testament, there are many interpretations, and some of them say about this, some of them that. It's just so much information sometimes that you can't even remember all of this. But you said still just read it. Maybe someday it will stay in your head. Somehow. Yeah, so. In part two of this talk, I guess I just say that um, we're going to talk about how to make sense of these things that don't make sense, right? Some different, um, some different tools that we have at our disposal to understand the scriptures when they might get confusing. But the best thing to do when we read something and we don't understand it is to just recognize that we're not in a position to understand it at this time and move on. Um, you know, and, th and this is true of any spiritual work, but especially of the scriptures. There will be things that are made that are clear to us. And there are things that won't be clear to us. And in time, these things will be made clear to us so long as we're living a life of repentance, a life of the church. Um, so, yeah, I, I would I would read these things um, and then try to understand them in the light of the, of the Gospels, especially. Um, how does this point to Christ? And if it just is at the point where you can't make sense of it, I would move on. Um, and we'll talk more about that next time. Um, you know how, how to read the Bible in the context of the fathers, how to read the Bible in the context of the liturgy, how to do how to use all of these tools at our disposal that God has given us to understand the scriptures. But for now, yeah, if, if there is something that is difficult to understand, it's best to just move on. Um, St. Augustine said if, if he finds a piece of text that he doesn't understand, um, it's, it's most likely that he doesn't understand what's actually being said. Um, the least likely is that the text itself is corrupted. Um, so basically, yeah, he, he says just to trust that you yourself don't understand what's going on. Um, so yeah. There's also, if, you, if you're really like looking for some explanation, and you, want to, like, and you can stand to go away from your physical book to an electronic device, there's apps and software out there that has commentary for the fathers. I'm glad to hear that you're volunteering to give part two of this talk, Michael. So, excellent. You can take that off of me. You can provide all of the resources in which you can understand it. Are there any more questions? No? All right. Why do some Bibles have more books? So, the canon is a very interesting thing. The word canon means rule, right? Um, means the measurement by which these things are to be understood. Um, the church has traditionally meant that to either mean the truth that's proclaimed in the scriptures or the very scriptures themselves. So the Protestants um, and many Western Christians have a shorter selection of books than we do, right? Um, and that's because they follow the Masoretic listing. The Masoretic text is an Old Testament that was translated by the Jews from the Greek back into Hebrew. And they took out all of these books that had been added over time that the, that the greater Jewish community throughout the diaspora had accepted as scripture, but they themselves did not, because they either weren't originally written in Greek, or for very, or very, weren't originally written in Hebrew, or for various other reasons. So this canon has become accepted by some. <clears throat> for us, 
we accept the Septuagint, which the Septuagint text was uh, the translation that was given by the 72 uh, Jewish scholars in Alexandria in the third century BC. Um, and so this, this translation, they took all of the Hebrew scriptures and also books that had been circulating around throughout the Jewish communities that either had, had been written in Hebrew and were now in Greek or had just initially been written in Greek, and they compiled those as well and presented them as a book. So this was accepted by all of the Greeks, all the Greek-speaking peoples as, as their canon, right? And this and then known as the Old Testament. Um, the New Testament has... Everyone has a uniform canon, except for the Ethiopians. They added books over time. Um, so ultimately, that's just because of the existence of a new canon presented by the Jews that some Protestants accepted, um, others didn't. And so for us, our canon has mostly been the same since like the 8th century. Um, some books have been added or removed over time, but... We should mention that the Masoretic translation took place after Christ. So took place after Christ. It was also... The prophecies about Christ uh, were sort of downplayed there, uh, or moved around a little bit, or left out. So um, generally, we don't accept that uh, that particular rendering as, as legitimate, and rather go to the Septuagint, which took which was translated hundreds of years before Christ and was looking towards the Messiah coming into the world. So that the perspective is very very different, and it's important to understand. That. Right. There, there's also a lot of errors. There's a lot of errors in the Masoretic text. I was actually uh, reading an article. It was written by some Muslim apologist with all of these errors found in the Old Testament. Um, and they said, well, you, you have all of these errors, and it disproves that the Bible was, was divinely inspired. And I decided to look into these errors just for fun, and they were all errors that crept in from the creation of the Masoretic text. If you read the, uh, if you read the Septuagint, those, those errors don't exist. So you know what when you when you translate things with an ideological bent, um, in this case the rejection of the savior, not only are you going to intentionally uh, intentionally muddy the scriptures, but you're also going to unintentionally muddy the scriptures because your concern is not with accuracy, but with a uh, with a view that is to be promulgated, right? So yeah, th this is a very big problem with. Um, with those who hold the Masoretic text, there are errors in it. There are things that are not clear, um, and it's and it's very clear if you read the New Testament that the apostles used the Septuagint. They were using the Septuagint text, um, and they were uh, teaching from it. And even in the early church, you know, they they all understood these texts as divinely inspired. Um, Saint Athanasios, in his on the incarnation of the Word, you know, formulates almost his entire argument for for the incarnation on the wisdom of Solomon. Um, you also have this, you know, St. Irenaeus of Lyon leaned heavily on wisdom of Sirach. So there, there's all of these uh, uses of Septuagint books in the early church. And, and yeah, the, the Masoretic text came at what, the 400s, Father? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, 400 years later. Um, and yeah, so, so that's why we have different canons and why we should hold to the canon we have. Marina has another question. That's just Psalm 151. Likely what they're saying is the division of the Psalms themselves. Because you have, um, the Psalms are divided in different ways. Uh, the numbering is different. So likely what they're saying is that the numbering is, is not according to the Masoretic usage or to the Jewish canon. It's most likely what they're trying to say. There's only one psalm that we have that's not in the Masoretic, which is Psalm 151. Um, and that was, that was included in the Septuagint because it had been widely accepted by the Jewish community at the time and was recognized as a psalm written by David and was used in liturgical life, um, even though we don't use it in the liturgical life today, but do we, Father Alexei? Is that read in churches? It's not read in churches. So, yeah, the, the Septuagint authors included the psalm um, because they had recognized the time that it was in use but was removed uh, with the translation of the Masoretic. Nick? But the numbering is different. I think that's important for people to understand. There's a difference between the Masoretic and the Septuagint numbering. So, this Masoretic 
Some were written by Solomon, some were written by others. It's the same with Proverbs. Proverbs is not all written by Solomon, it's a compilation. Um, so he compiled some. Um, and that, that's even said, I can't remember which of the books, I believe it's Kings, when one of the kings finds the books of wisdom. And it says that there were more, there were thousands of verses from Solomon, but they only accepted certain ones to be included. So ultimately the, the Proverbs, for example, is, is but a portion of what Solomon wrote that was compiled and believed to be useful and beneficial for the people. Um, it's the same thing with the Psalms. Most, most of them were written by David, but not all were written by David. You'll see that some were written by Solomon, some were written by others. Um, how and when could the church decide which readings go for each day on the calendar? Um, over time. It wasn't something that happened in one sitting. Um, it just... It just happened. So there were various different lectionaries that existed that were in circulation, and um, I don't know at which point the current lectionary we have was put into usage by the entire church. Well, actually, that's not true, because the Greeks have a different lectionary than we do. So th there is not a uniform lectionary in all of the churches. We have the lectionary that was, that was instituted by the Typicon of, of uh, St. Saba. So that's the lectionary we use, but the Greeks have a different lectionary, and there are other lectionaries. So it's just something that developed over time. Um, I don't have a specific date. I don't know if anyone has a specific date for that. I like scripture can still be added into it, like as saints are added. Well, there's a, a, there's a reading that's appointed for the day, and then the saints, if they're a high enough rank saint, have a reading that they bring with them. Right, so today the the second reading was for the royal martyrs. It doesn't matter that it was Sunday. If it was Monday, we would still read that same oh, one. Right, so that's true of higher ranking saints, and most of the more con contemporary saints have been ranked, ha have been given a higher rank by the people who wrote the uh, the service. It used to be that all martyrs were simple service, all hierarchs were a uh, polyleos or vigil service. But that's, that's all changed in the last couple of hundred years. Although in our parish, we often kind of knock them down a notch or two so that they conform to what the standard of the church was. But the point is that if the saint in the Menean, which is the daily service, not the weekly service, not the, not the one that has to do with like today is Sunday, but the one that has to do with today is July 4th, which was probably really American Independence Day because they were using the Julian calendar at that time. Slight digression. In any case, that, that comes with the saint and stays on July 4th. Whereas this Sunday is always going to, this Sunday after Pentecost is always going to have the same thing. So there's two, there's several cycles that are floating around each other. There's three actually. There's a lot so, of moving parts. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. But actually, it's all algebraic. It all makes sense. Once you understand if this, then that, that's always true. So liturgic seems like kind of some dark science or something, but it's actually very clear. It's just a matter of grasping what's being said. Once you understand that, it's very obvious. Yeah. Henri? Uh, so regarding the Masoretic text and uh, I know there are several sayings, including Philaret of Moscow, that did use the Masoretic text to aid them in their translation work. So with that in mind, are there some specific areas in which the Masoretic text is reliable or at least useful for translation work, or what's the greater context behind that? Well, it's reliable in the sense that it shows the the accepted canon of the Jews in Jerusalem, right? So, so you read Saint Athanasius, Saint August, or not Saint Augustine, sorry, Saint Athanasius, Saint Jerome, Saint John, Damascus, and others all accepted the Masoretic canon as, as legitimate because this was the canon of the Jews. And St. Athanasios predates the Masoretic. So it's clear that this was understood as the canon in Jerusalem, right? So there's this very interesting kind of interplay with that and how do we handle the other books in there that are not a part of the quote-unquote canon, right? Um, so there, there's very much in, in the church, there is not a clear 
Um, it's not a binary. It's not either this is scripture or this isn't scripture. Or this is canon or this isn't canon. It's, it's, there is a, uh, a range, right? And so those books that are not canonical, if you will, are, are good for reading in the church, for the edification of the faithful, and for the instruction of catechumens. In other words, it means that there's an understanding they're divinely inspired, but that they were not a part of the Jewish canon. They were simply the canon of the greater Jewish community outside of Jerusalem. So, um, yeah, St. Philaret of Moscow says that we accept these other books because of their usefulness and because of their benefit, right? And ultimately, the books that the church considers scripture, scripture is determined by the church, right? The, the, it, is, it is a liturgical text written for a liturgical community. So the worshiping community chooses those books and, and identifies those books which are useful for the continuation of the worshiping community. Um, so just because the Jews didn't accept these other books in Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem, to be clear, as canonical does not mean that the rest of that the church has to reject these books right there is use in them and they are um they are really excellent wisdom of solomon is one of the greatest catechetical texts that the church has i mean read that and and try to deny the incarnation of christ you simply can't um uh, deny all the things that saint that uh saint solomon are talking about point to christ um so so all of these things uh, we have, you know, the, the church recognizes these books that are inspired by God and are useful for uh, his glory and for the edification of the faithful. So we can recognize that the canon was different for the Jews and also recognize that uh, the Lord has given authority to the church, the new Israel, to determine that which is useful. We should also remember <coughs> that at that time of Metropolitan uh, Philaret, that the education of clergy in the in the Russian church was essentially just a translation of Latin seminary text. So their, the influence on the Russian church from the West was very strong uh, for many hundreds of years, almost really until 100 years before the revolution, or even less, uh, when Metropolitan Anthony Krapovitsky was given the responsibility by the Holy Synod to orthodoxize, for lack of a better term, the seminaries uh, in the Russian <coughs> Empire. And so before he was the first hierarch of the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia, he had that gargantuan task, which he essentially accomplished. And uh, the, the situation now is that seminaries in the Russian Orthodox Church much more resemble seminaries in Greece than they do in Italy. If you wish to learn more about those endeavors or anything about Metropolitan Anthony, speak to Father Alexei. He knows. <laughs> Father Alexei has an interesting monastic name. He was already named Anthony, so he couldn't be named Anthony after Metropolitan, uh, Metropolitan Anthony Karpovitsky's saint. So Lydia thought, well, why don't we name him after the saint that Metropolitan Anthony Karpovitsky had before he was a monastic? And he was Alexei before he was a monastic. Man of God. All right. Other questions? Well, if there are no more questions, I mean, I, the, the most important thing out of all of this is that the scriptures are the word of God. They are the words that point to the word, as St. Maximus says. So if we wish to know who Christ is, we must read the scriptures. If we wish to find peace in our lives, if we wish to live a healthy spiritual life, we have to read the scriptures. The scriptures will give us the means through which to live an authentic Orthodox life. Um, so, you know, that's my, that's my charge for everyone here. If you aren't reading the Bible, read it. Um, Pick it up, open it. There shouldn't be any dust. There should be no dust on your Bible. If there's any dust on your Bible, I hope you're going to confession. <laughs> because, I mean, you should be going to confession regardless. When The more you read the scriptures, the more you realize you need confession. The less you read the scriptures, the less you'll desire to go to confession because the less you'll desire to live a spiritual life. So, you know, a lot of these things and a lot of this, the issues that we deal with in everyday life, the fathers say there is, there is always like... There are always various different things that the fathers give us to in, to fight the various passions, and almost unanimous between all of them is the reading of the scriptures. Um, sometimes there are certain scriptures you read for certain passions, but ultimately what unites all of the advice the fathers give and all of the different passions is you should be reading the Bible. <laughs> so read the Bible. Read the Bible and allow it to uh, work in you and change you, and, and I think through that you know, this will be a really beneficial thing for your, for your spiritual lives. Thank you, Father.